Hi everybody, welcome to this special CUBE conversation. It has been a busy several months and I'm really pleased to have friend of the CUBE, Stu Miniman in. Stu is the head of uh, market intelligence at Red Hat and of course, mega time CUBE alum, former CUBE host. Great to see you, Stu. Dave, uh, great to see you too. Uh, I used to love, we used to like travel all over the country or over the world sometimes and get together after a spurt of it to kind of debrief on it. I only had a couple of trips and one of them was a home show here in Boston. Uh, you on the other hand have definitely been racking up uh, the miles, but uh, great to see you, great to chat. You know, it's funny, so here I am in Boston. I flew out to the Dell show. John is in California, he flew out to IBM Think. We crossed, you know, paths. We met at the airport in Vegas, did a high five. He went off and did Dell, I came in and did IBM. Both great shows. I mean, it's been really an amazing, you know, AI quarter. <laughs> Right. And then of course I was catching up on some of the action from Red Hat Summit. I mean, it seems like KubeCon was like <laughs> decades ago. Yeah. But the whole focus on AI, it's just um, been amazing. But I think Red Hat had a different spin on it, particularly the emphasis on open source, on open ecosystem. I mean, everybody talks about those, but I think you guys really live that. Um, so can you explain the sort of angle that you have on open source software and AI. How do those two meet? Yeah, Dave, thanks. Uh, so of course, I mean, Red Hat, open source is the core of what we do, of course. We are an enterprise software company with an open source delivery model. And when it comes to open source, there's been a lot of questions, what does that mean? There's been a number of the LLMs out there that have various models out there. Some are more open than others. Some have restrictions as to how you can use it. From a Red Hat standpoint, when we do something, it, it, it's going to be open. So there were a lot of announcements that we made at Red Hat Summit. Um, and one of the really interesting pieces is we're working closely with IBM Research on this. So uh, first of all, uh, IBM had a model, Granite, that is now fully open source. Uh, so the Granite model uh, you know, can be used in a lot of different ways. It's a you know, generalized, but for enterprise use model. Um, the, Thing that I was most excited about is we have this uh, this this tool called Instruct Lab, um, which allows fine tuning of a model, and it's a little bit complicated. I spent a little bit of time digging into it. I by no means am an AI expert, but um, we saw a need in the marketplace because when you talk about open, one, it's the licensing, but two, it's the contribution model. Uh, you know what we want in this space is to allow uh, more people to participate. You know, I think back, Dave, when we talked about the big data era, which you covered in depth, it's does a data scientist need to be involved in everything or how can we allow people to get more value out of their data and value out of more things where you don't have to be a nation state or you know, one of the Fortune 50 companies to do that. And Instruct Labs helping to do that by lowering that bar. So fine tuning is, uh, is something that you do after the pre-training. So pre-training typically takes months, I need you know, lots of compute resources and it takes, you know, it's not something that I'm going to do that often. The fine tuning before Instruct Lab, usually you take like literally a thousand people would be writing examples in and creating tables and, you know, doing all of this tuning to make sure that it fits my business need. With Instruct Lab, you can just do a few of the prompts in there and it will generate more, uh, examples of that to help train that model. And then you can iterate on that to actually adjust that model for your business. And then you can still use RAG after that to be able to have your vector bit databases and real time sources of data uh, to modify data. But those modifications that you're making can be put out in the community and part of an activity. Um, or if there's proprietary data, you can make sure that that is uh, you know, kept in your own environment. This training, piece, uh, not training, but the, the fine tuning piece, post training. It's interesting because, you know, early on in the Gen AI days, I mean, there are, there are companies, there still are, who provide a service, a human service, like Mechanical Turk, to thumbs up, thumbs down, you know, give feedback. And that is sort of how a lot of these models were trained. I remember OpenAI put out a paper, oh, it was over maybe a year ago now, talking about, uh, a, less sophisticated models being able to train more sophisticated models, so the AI training the AI, um, so less human intervention. Um, and you know, humans don't get, I mean, uh, uh, models, you know, AI doesn't get tired, doesn't get bored. And so, but to the extent that you can generate that 
I, I don't know if we consider that synthetic data. I, I guess it is. Um, and then that allows you to train those models or tune those models much more effectively. But before we get too deep into the AI, I want to get into the AI journey. I want to, I want to ask you about the, the intersection between uh, open source software generally, OpenShift specifically and, and modernization. You and I in this very studio when IBM acquired Red Hat, we said, you know, this, 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 the economic model, the ROI model is not so much about cloud, it's about application modernization. And IBM has this huge consulting sales uh, or, or consulting organization. And they've got this giant install base of customers with applications that need to be modernized. You layer Red Hat OpenShift on top of that and you begin the modernization exercise and it gets so much credibility for IBM into the open source world. They're like all in on open source. So now we're talking about, now we're, that, that was sort of the, the, the first wave of IBM and, and Red Hat working you know, as one company. Now we're in a new era of modernization. What does modernization mean today? Obviously it brings in machine intelligence. Yeah. How do you see it? Yeah, Dave, it's a great point. Actually, I sat on a panel uh, at IBM Think talking about application modernization. And when we were prepping, I said, look, this term app modernization, it's more than a decade old. You know, remember when app modernization was, oh, it should work with mobile. And then app modernization Cloud. was, you know, <laughs> uh, from, you know, back the Wikibon research, when you it come out of app modernization, if you don't have data-driven solutions, you have not modernized your environment. What does it mean today? Well, it better have AI infused as part of what you're doing because AI is getting into every app and every corner of, of our ecosystem uh, that, that we have today. So you're right, Dave, and it's interesting. I saw, uh, you know, Arvind, uh, the, the CEO of IBM was on CNBC uh, recently, and. I can't comment on the HashiCorp acquisition, but I'll repeat what he said because they were like, oh, HashiCorp and AI, and he's like, hold on a second. HashiCorp is to help with the journey that IBM has been on, including the Red Hat acquisition for hybrid cloud. Because if you're not automating, if you're not set for scale, if you can't flex out and back um, and make this easier for your infrastructure to do, you will not be able to take advantage of AI because it will actually increase how much you need all of these things. We know that years ago, we went beyond human scale for most of our applications, you know, so we've got to have automation uh, in involved in this. And from an infrastructure standpoint, I mean, that's microservices and analytics and all these tools that we build on. That's what we have to do. And that's what we've been doing with OpenShift for a decade now. And the growth of Kubernetes, you know, Kubernetes itself is now 10 years old. Um, it's the foundational layer that runs everything from you know, the Wi-Fi on the plane that you run to, to the bank transactions and everything in between. Well, and it enables customers to tap innovation. I mean, the, the hyperscalers have given the industry this massive gift, you know, um, as, <laughs> as often as people want to attack the hyperscalers because they're so giant and they're you know, huge monopolies or, or oligopolies. Uh, the gift that they've given is this massive CapEx investment they built huge ecosystems and there's just tons of innovation there. So the point being to the extent that you can tap that innovation across different clouds and make that much easier, which is what you guys basically do with Kubernetes, OpenShift is, is clearly done. Um, then customers just got more choice, which is what you guys are all about. I wanted to come back to actually in thinking about just sort of the, the AI um, modernization. I wonder if there's, when you talk to a lot of customers and I've talked to several these past couple of months, as you think about bringing AI into your portfolio, how are you rationalizing that portfolio? What, you know, what's going to be under fire? Is it, you know, productivity apps? Is it collaboration apps? Um, people are starting to rethink that. They're sort of hitting the pause on some of the investments that they, they're making. We saw with Salesforce, uh, having a little bit of tepid guidance yesterday. And I think a lot of that is customers are confused. Like, what do I do with AI? Where do I, how do I actually get the real value? Um, and that's where obviously open source helps you along that journey. But what are you seeing in terms of customers beginning to rethink or rationalize their portfolio as a result of AI. Yeah, David's a great point. So uh, you used to run the peer insights and the thing that we always at the end said, uh, you need to get rid of stuff. GRS. Um, get rid of it. stuff. Yeah. So um, I met with a couple of customers recently and they talked about that 
really understanding our portfolio. The, the, the unfortunate things is most enterprises have hundreds. They know they have thousands of applications, and there's many of them that they don't have good visibility into it. You know, we've had this era of observability and you know how I can optimize my environments. First thing is let me really understand what I have and what can I kill. There's so many things out there that it's like, wait, I should move to a modern platform. I can satisfy some things. There's applications that have outlived their life. You know, the greatest sin we had too often is, you know, I just kind of fossilized that application, stuck it in a corner, and there were a few users of it, and it was miserable to work. You know, it, one of the biggest advantages newer companies have is they can take advantage of these new applications. I can use these wonderful new modern databases that didn't exist 10 years ago. So, you know, we always know if I could start today with a blank sheet of paper, I would be better off. We all have technical debt, and getting out of that is a challenge. Um, and some of these, Dave, you know, AI can help. It's interesting. We have uh, one of our sets of tools in open source we have is called uh, uh, Conveyor. Conveyor are some of these tools to help look at your existing environment and say, is this something that's ready to go to the cloud? Can I move it from a, a virtualization uh, to containerization or move it over to another virtualization platform? Well, guess what, Dave? Conveyor has an AI piece that now will infuse the knowledge and the learning and the training into what it's done. So, you know, the hope is that AI is going to help improve productivity on a lot of this, and that'll that'll also uh, tie into the tooling. I think we're, thanks for that. I think we're seeing too, we, we've talked about this, that, that AI budgets are being funded by stealing from other areas. It's not like this whole, you know, giant new, you know, checkbook is coming in from the CFO. Um, we're, we're seeing the ROI expectations get pushed a little bit. Customers are hitting, hitting singles. So this is, people are, I think are starting to realize, well, this AI thing it maybe is not so simple um, as the, 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 the guys on the all-in pod seem, seem to make it sound. Um, this is going to be a journey. And, and that really requires, uh, uh, you got to have a lot of partners. You got to have an, 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 an open ecosystem all up and down the stack and along the customer journey. You know, it's interesting, you, Arvin's comments, I think he's right on. Okay, maybe HashiCorp is not a direct hit on AI, but it's going to, to our earlier point, enable you to tap innovations that might be on-prem, might be in AWS or Google or Azure, is going to make that experience uh, identical essentially across those, those estates. Um, so it's, it's not just up and down the stack, it's all along that, that journey and that, that maturity curve. So how do you, uh, uh, and this was a big theme at, at Summit, yeah. Red Hat Summit, was that that commitment to an open ecosystem? Add some color to it. Yeah, that. And, and Dave, here's one of the things we we look at is we know customers are going to have that heterogeneous environment. You know, one of the maxims is nothing ever dies in IT. <laughs> so, GRS. you know, <laughs> but when you talk about okay, customer, they have their data center, they're using multiple public clouds, they're pushing things out to the edge. <laughs> Nvidia today is the leader in you know the 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 acceleration, uh, but. All the cloud providers have their chips. Uh, out of the edge, you know, they're, they're, there's competitors that are there. Our software is really going to be flexible and work across all those environments. Uh, one of the panels I ran at Summit uh, had a great customer, and Intel was sitting there because they were uh, one of the to helping to partner uh, with this company AI Sweden uh, to, to help generate uh, innovation in uh, everything from startups to education and farming uh, in, in the Nordics. Uh, and you know, Intel, of course, not sitting still, trying to you know chip away at some of NVIDIA's lead that they have there. Um, see some articles that you've been, uh, you and John have been writing and talking about some of the other potential competitors to NVIDIA out there. So from our standpoint, we're going to partner as deeply as we can across those environments. Um, our mission always in open source is to make it consumable for enterprises and to help build that ecosystem and to do it as, as open a way as possible. We had, you know, nice presence at the Dell show that you were at. Uh, we've got folks at the HPE show that's coming up, uh, you know, in the data center environment, because it, it's interesting when you talk about prioritization, Dave, um, absolutely there's a lot of this that is happening in the public clouds and a lot of attention played to the partnership of open AI with, uh, with Microsoft and Anthropic uh, with, with Amazon. Uh, but many of the customers I'm talking about, uh, talking to, they're starting in their data centers. They get a handful of machines, they get their GPUs, um, because 
while I'm told that my data is going to be secured, I know if I can wall things off, um, I'm going to be more secure. And one of the things they love about Instruct Lab is Dave. I can download it on my laptop. I don't even have to be connected to Wi-Fi when I'm working on it. I could do it while I'm on a plane or sitting in a bunker somewhere where I know nobody's going to be getting uh, screenshots. So I want to I want to come back to the story behind Instruct Lab. Last November, I was down at the Thomas. Uh, Jay Watson Research Center, which was awesome. Uh, Dan O'Brien, who heads AR for IBM, invited a bunch of analysts down there. It was really a tremendous uh, display of technology, of innovation, and there was a lot of opportunity for Q&A. So of course, you know, I chimed right in. And my, one of the big sort of concerns I've always had with IBM was their ability to take this unbelievable R&D capability and turn it into product. You and I have talked about this, you know, for years uh, on theCUBE. And so I asked Dario Gill and Rob Thomas, like what's changed? And they spent, I don't know, a good five to seven minutes giving examples of how um, they're, they're much more aligned with, with, with getting sort of from the lab into the, the market to actually make an impact. You know, Xerox Park, amazing, Bell Labs, amazing, but so much of that stuff never actually turned into for those companies that own them turned into actual products that they that drove revenue. But the, the Instruct Lab is kind of interesting. It's almost like there was this really interesting experiment coming out of R&D, and then somebody from Red Hat picked up on it. Tell that story. Yeah, so, so Dave, first of all, you know, when it comes to the IBM Red Hat relationship, we are separate, but we do have conversations and talk there. So there are executive level discussions that are always happening. And research is something that our team has had access to. So uh, my management chain goes down, you know, meets with uh, some of the research places, and there's always research happening at Red Hat too, and there's places where they've been collaborating. So uh, Instruct Lab, a paper was written, and Red Hat got involved. Uh, it's something that, uh, you know, at the, at the summit stage, you know, Matt Hitz talked about that he personally is just he said reinvigorated uh, with, with how excited he is there. He had been looking at all the AI pieces and this is an area where many of the people that were working on it in Cambridge at an IBM facility moved over to Red Hat. And part of it, they said, hey, actually we can get better focus here, as well as Red Hat had more resources that we could bring to bear. And that's where we're sorting through how do we go to market and you know productize all of this, but it's going to be open source, and therefore it makes sense that Red Hat is more heavily involved. So um, it, it's an interesting thing because we do have collaboration between the companies, even though we, we are kept separate, and it really is that opportunity with AI uh, to be able to partner together and, and, and bring that forward. Well, OpenShift by its very nature makes that easier. Yeah. When you think about OpenShift AI, Watson X, Granite, other LLMs, explain that relationship and then let's dig into some of the other LLMs. Yeah, so, so right, first of all, so I mean, OpenShift, an application development platform, um, not just containerization, Kubernetes at its core, but has a lot of tools in there for your developer. OpenShift AI product we launched a few years ago it was originally called Red Hat OpenShift Data Science. And by its very nature, it was a set of open source tools predominantly for the data scientists. Dave, data scientist doesn't want to think about the infrastructure underneath it. The developer doesn't want to think about the infrastructure underneath it. When we first launched it, we have a managed service in the cloud. Red Hat OpenShift service on AWS, Rosa, our default was, hey, our SRA team can manage that entire stack for you. Let your data scientists and your application developers work on what they had. You don't have to worry about anything underneath of it. We got some customers. One of our, our lighthouse customer on that is Boston University here. Here, they have a data scientist class that they leverage uh, the Red Hat OpenShift data, uh, OpenShift AI on OpenShift in the cloud. Um, they can spin up resources when the class is in session. They spin it down. Very cost effective. Well, our customers came and they said, "Hey, <laughs> you know, we actually love this, but we'd like it in the data center." And it was the first product that we said. Well, it didn't start in the data center and Cloudify it. This was a cloud first and cloud only service and we made it in the data center. So, okay, I can work on models, I can deliver models, I can do a lot with it. Well, Instruct Lab is going to supercharge how we actually deal with models. And 
one of those models is an IBM model. So it's the granite one we mentioned before. Um, if I want somebody to be able to just get their hands on this in a really easy manner, uh, we launch RHEL AI. So that is the operating system with the granite model so that an individual can just work on that in their environment. If they want to scale it and serve it and do it to a much broader enterprise, that could then expand and grow into OpenShift AI where we could deliver it more broadly. Um, InstructLab can work across these environments, but InstructLab and OpenShift AI are not limited to only the Granite model. The other open source models, wherever they kind of fit on that spectrum, like Mistral, uh, IBM announced a, an expanded partnership with them at the show, uh, of course, is, is, a, is a great one, and Llama uh, is a good one. Uh, you've got IBM in the AI Alliance partnership with Meta. So, Again, <laughs> varying levels of open source and some of the models to be sorted out, but from a customer standpoint, if I have these environments, uh, I can you know, take advantage of them, I can do the fine tuning, and we have lots of tools to help you across the, the way. And then, of course, on top of OpenShift AI, if you want Watson X and the portfolio that they have there, including their industry-leading governance offering, which, if you call it at IBM Think, uh, AWS uh, SageMaker um, now also uh, can, can work with the IBM Watson X governance. Yeah, so I mean, you know, people I think are beginning to understand, wow, Watson X, it's, it's the son of Watson is not the original Watson, which was, IBM tried to put that in places where perhaps it didn't belong, but now Watson X, you look at Watson X data, uh, uh, governance, um, the capabilities there are, are, are leading edge. You talked about you know, sort of OpenShift enabling, you know, broad adoption. The other sort of iconic product in Red Hat is, is RHEL, RHEL AI, uh, essentially powering anything, anywhere, particularly the edge. So AI at the edge, AI inferencing at the edge gets really interesting. We think it's going to be the dominant workload. Probably 80% of the work is going to be AI inferencing, AI work, AI inferencing at the edge. Florian and I wrote about this two years ago. Yeah. And, and, and Dave, you know, we've been working with customers on that, you know, long before this, yeah. you know, uh, generative AI wave. Because you're right, inferencing at the edge is a huge opportunity. Uh, I've been working with customers on that for a few years now, um, and. What I found interesting is Summit, it was those customers that had gone down the predictive AI uh, journey were in a much better position to take advantage of some of the generative AI pieces. And especially if they already had OpenShift and maybe even OpenShift AI on top of that, they were ready to take advantage of things so much faster. Some of the other uh, news that I picked up on from Red Hat was the light speed with Ansible extended now to RHEL and OpenShift. Explain sort of the status of that, what's available when, why is this important? Yep. So. Uh, it, it, it's interesting. So uh, the uh, Ansible Lightspeed uh, is something that was actually unveiled right before ChatGPT hit the world. Um, but it was using the, the Watson X Code Assist uh, to be able to help Ansible customers create playbooks faster. So use natural language, type in what I want, and it would generate a playbook for me. So, you know, one of the early things is, you know, hey, how can chatbots help accelerate my productivity? Well. I tell it what I want, it generates a playbook, I modify what I need, and I'm off and running. Um, a lot of these tools are really good to be able to help me uh, either take something from one language to another or you know, get further along on that code. So the Ansible Lightspeed, something that's actually been available for a while, we expanded Lightspeed to, to across the whole portfolio announcement at Summit. So with OpenShift, uh, basically it's going to be an AI assistant in the OpenShift console itself. So hey, uh, I'm thinking about, you know, do I turn on auto scaling or how do I grow my environment? It can say like, based on what you have, these are some of the recommendations. Here's where you can find more documentation or here's the steps that you should follow to go on that. And that very much is a bring your model uh, to be able to do that and train it on your specific environment. The, the example that we gave in Summit was an insurance company uh, where it would, it, it would expedite some of the processing uh, of, of some of their, uh, their, their claims. Um, if right now it is bring your own model, uh, do we expect that we will have some granite models that will be trained for some of these environments? That, that, that's likely, and we talked about that directionally. Uh, for OpenShift, that's an alpha today. And then from a RHEL standpoint, again, infusing in AI to help uh, improve the overall productivity there. Um, don't have a timeline yet for, for the RHEL light speed uh, piece of things, but 
Absolutely. Um, I mean, Dave, I don't know about you, but every app update I get now has an AI feature in it. I can get Copilot in like four different ways on my phone, I think. Um, so, you know, we're seeing it I infusing all over and we, like everybody else, are taking advantage it's of it. It's going to be interesting, right? I mean, it, right. AI is going to be ubiquitous, going to be embedded. Copilots are essentially going to be, be widely available, if not free. I mean, I pay for ChatGPT and, and, and did early on. And, and perplexity, I buy the, you know, the subscriptions as well, but over time they're going to become less valuable because I'm going to be able to tap the, these uh, everywhere. It's evolving very quickly, you hear that a lot, um, and it's, but it's true. But I wonder if, if you could address uh, something that I heard Bob LaLiberté talking about, which is AI culture, in terms of you know, customers trying to develop that. It sounds like a little bit of motherhood and apple pie, but in fact, uh, it's like security. If you can get people to really be aware, um, you can you can get have a you know, much bigger impact on the organization across the organization. You know, culture is very important, and having a focus on AI and and a north star around AI. You know, what the objectives are, what are you trying to drive? Obviously, people are hitting singles with productivity today. Um, and you're you're not seeing you know giant you know cure cancer types of things. Those will come. It'll take five to seven years, uh, but how important is a an AI culture? Is that is that a real thing or is it just BS? Yeah, Dave, I, I, I like it. You know, unfortunately, so so many times if we look at what are the barriers to really taking advantage of this, it's. I see that as something that's going to impact my job negatively. You know, I'm not on board. You know, I'm happy doing things the way I am. Uh, and so, you know, we've seen waves of technology before where we know it's the people that are going to stand in the way. Um, I think back to when, like, the industrial internet first ca uh, it came out, and you know, it, we worked on some research on that. And it was like IT and OT, you know, don't get along well. Um, talk about edge and AI inferencing. It's those OT people that are at the front of the line and we've seen some good progress, but it's taken years and years and there's been changes in some of the people uh, in, involved in that. I had a, um, back at, you mentioned KubeCon, um, I actually did a short video with a robotics company that we partner with um, that's leveraging AI inferencing out at the edge and uh, what they do there. And it very much is an OT environment and we make it so easy that out at the edge, they don't need to understand all the IT nuances. Um, it's just automated and takes care of it. So uh, culture is important. And you know, Dave, I've been at Red Hat three and a half years now. One of the things that we don't talk a ton about, but our customers say that we help them along with, is our focus on open source is very much community driven. And part of that community is customers come to us because we can help them get their problems solved and get features up into the community and therefore, we're helping them along that journey. So from an AI standpoint, you know, I, I was thrilled to see, you know, over half the people that attended Red Hat Summit did the hands-on with Instruct Lab. Sure, they probably wanted the t-shirt or the hoodie that they got if they did it, but I had many conversations with them that they were really excited and immediately could think of uses that they had. Uh, because today also, it's like, I get access to this and it's not something I even have to pay for at, at this point. So. That culture absolutely is important. Uh, you know, we always think that if you look at open innovation in general, you know, together we can always accomplish more. I need to make sure my data uh, and intellectual property um, is 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 taken care of. But the biggest thing I've seen when I think back to 20 years ago, some of the same financial institutions or government organizations I'm meeting with today. 20 years ago, oh my God, the clearance and NDAs and what you had to talk about. And now like they're sitting on panels and sharing with their peers what they're doing because, I mean, Dave, they have all, all have access to the same cloud, to many of the same models. Um, and there's communities that have formed around some of these environments. So uh, helping to understand that culture and moving forward because if we always know if I don't take advantage of it, it will put me at a competitive disadvantage. So. Yeah, I mean, that, it, is, it is true. And they want to tell their stories. It's three and a half years. Wow, Stu. I see but I see your videos. You still got a little cube DNA in there. And as you know, go back to your product DNA at, at, at EMC. You have a, is your, your video series, is it a regular series? Tell, tell people how they can access that. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, uh, it's called In the Clouds. If you go to red.ht slash in the clouds, no space. Uh, I usually do it about once a month. It's usually an executive interview. When I, what used to be an like Red Hat guest only. And when I took it over, I'm like, 
come on, no, this has to be like external and community. Um, oh, and ecosystem. Dave, um, <laughs> you know, many of my guests are Cube alums. I had, you know, a great ex executive from Amazon uh, who I'd known for many years. Um, when the uh, VMware Broadcom news was announced, I had Steve Herod on, you know, that week. Uh, and actually, uh, in the month of June, I'm super excited. I'm going to have Brian Stevens, who I first met when he was CTO at Red Hat. I saw him a couple of weeks ago, and he's like, Stu, I didn't even realize you were at Red Hat. And it's uh, he's at a company, Neuromagic, which uh, he's the CEO of on uh, Talk About AI. They're involved in VLLM, which is super important uh, in this space. And uh, I believe they're Cambridge based. So Where know, do I go to find this again? Yeah. Red.ht slash in the clouds. It's on YouTube. So it's on both the Red Hat in the corporate YouTube channel as well as the OpenShift YouTube channel. We also put it out on Twitch. So it's live. q and is welcome. Um, and, you know, if people need to reach me, I'm just stu at redhat.com. I did manage to snag that email because nobody can spell my last name. You're probably. still at Stu, yeah. too, on, on Twitter. So, <laughs> Stu, thanks so much for coming back in the studio. It was great awesome. to see you. Thanks. Great chat. All right. Thank you for watching. This is Dave Vellante. Thanks for watching this CUBE conversation. We'll see you next time.